Hello, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Peter Harrop, Chairman of ID TechX, and uh, always excited to come to the Fraunhofer Institutes, which are a massive uh, benefit to Germany and linked all over the world, of course. And in this particular case, uh, we have one Fraunhofer Institute exhibiting a large number of things here at the ID TechX show. And I want to ask uh, for an introduction, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Manuel Gensler from the Fraunhofer Institute of Applied Polymer Research, IAP. Uh, we are situated here in Potsdam Gaul. And uh, we're doing uh, a lot of topics dealing with fluid processing of thin films, like uh, the techniques to apply the films, printing techniques, um, and also from the material side to make OLEDs, to make organic photovoltaics, and, um, and to, to also to de develop new printing techniques uh, such as the uh, electrostatic printing. All oh, right. So, uh, what are we looking at here with these bright colors? So here, uh, the, the bright colors. These, those are actually quantum dots, cadmium-free quantum dots. Uh, you uh, mentioned cadmium here, which rather surprised me. It's been banned in the ECS, isn't it? Cad cadmium uh, is in danger of getting banned in the European Union for display applications as well. Um, at the moment, there's still an ex exclusion, but uh, this this is in, in, in danger. So there's a huge interest of cadmium-free quantum dots, yeah. and we have great expertise in making indium-based cadmium-free quantum dots, uh, like LG and Samsung. Uh, like LG and Samsung, who have a great interest, but their uh, their quantum dots so far are cadmium-based. Oh, uh, they told us. Indium, I th oh, I see that. Already Indium? Yeah, they wrote to us oh. and said they were on Indium commercially, and so they benefit from the... I thought the band okay. was coming in in October. Anyway, we need to do our homework on that, okay. I don't know. But you're okay. obviously concentrating on Indium we, uh, yeah. because it's, it certainly will not be banned. They, they also have mm. interest uh, and contacts um, to, uh, to, to our... Uh, our technologies, mm. uh, because when it comes to the efficiencies, indium is still a bit behind yes, yes, cadmium-based yes, yes, yeah, uh, yeah. quantum dots, and that's that's where we're doing material research. Yes, yes. So and yes. and here you see some some examples. Those are three different sized indium phosphide quantum dots, illuminated by UV light from the bottom. Yes, yes, yes. And de depending on the on the size, for the larger sizes. Um, you get uh, colors in the, in the red range, uh, over the yellow to the green range when you make them really small. Oh, excellent. Now, tell me about this multifunctional work that you're displaying here. We are very interested in the trend away from components in a box to smart materials now with, you know, car body works going to be a super capacitor as well as photovoltaics and many multi-layer things are coming in. And of course, you can work at different sizes with different technologies, can't you? Very small things, you know, maybe some 3D printed electronics and then medium-sized products in mold structural electronics with Tactotech here and so on, and big drones up in the sky and so on. That's not going to be either of those. It's going, it uh, already is, real-to-real -real processes and laminations. Um, where do you come in? Multifunctional in your terms. What does that mean? So, good, yeah, good. Good question. So, um, so multi-functional. Oh, okay. yeah. uh, so. okay. Um, yeah. Let's let's keep on. Let's stick to the examples of these these quantum dots. Um, okay, right. You you have the the core of the quantum dots, which yes. defines the colors of them. Yes. And um, so now you can use them for different applications. Uh, he, here in, in the fluids, you see them as color conver uh, color converters. Absolutely. Yes. In a in a fluid sense yeah. uh, way, you can also make a different shell, make the shell smaller to make them. Uh, electroluminescent, and that's what we have here. Okay. We have the so same quantum dots, right, right. the orange and the green one, in an OLED stack, um, which are electroluminescent lighting here. So, um, 
those multifunctional materials, may they, will they sometimes appear in devices that are multifunctional using the material for one thing and then another, like uh, self-powered piezoelectric energy harvesters used for the same piezoelectric or as a triboelectric equivalent where you would um, act as a sensor but you create the power as well. It's all the same, one material. It's one, uh, is it uh, an optical equivalent there where they could be sensors and emitters with the same material or something like that? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the polymers uh, are usually optimized for, uh, for, for their purpose. And an emitting polymer uh, has typically other properties than in, than in light collecting polymer. Yeah. Um, so when, when you want, want to have a multifunctional device, uh, then you need to think of combining this more more on a um, on, on an ins on a technical uh, yes. point of view by, ah, by placing right. them clever. Yeah. So we we had applications. Uh, we had an OLED in in the wet range and a sensor nearby on a on a strip. Uh, which could be used uh, as a sensor application then. Um, but to, to have them have the same material in the same stack for different applications um, is usually something that today not yet no, knows. Okay. So your use of the word multifunctional is that the same base material could be, when it is customized, used for different functions in yeah. separate in, devices. Indeed, yeah. There's no convergence planned at this point. Okay. So it's useful. What else should we be learning about? What other things have you uh, on display today? Yeah. So, so uh, this this here on this side is also cut quantum quantum dots, um, and uh, this this is another ID application for the quantum dots. They are they are phosphorescent here, also illuminated by by a bluish UV light, and um, you see probably uh, a barcode application here and this is kind of a security feature so you, uh, you have on the one hand a printed barcode which you could have on your on your drug paper um, and when you scan the barcode you see the whole history of this drug from the producer to the pharmacy store optionally to the to the uh, to the doctor uh, till you receive it and then you know you have the original drug additionally this barcode is printed with a, qu a quantum dot who has a, which has a very narrow emission band. And this is very difficult to, um, to reproduce by, by possible drug dealers. Um, so only when you have this specific type of quantum dot and you, if you have the ability to make this, you, could, you, could ma uh, yeah, you, you can print this security feature. That's very exciting, isn't it? That's a major problem, a huge problem. No, that would be wonderful. Tell me about um, a very different world that you've got uh, displayed behind me above my head, the uh, world of perovskites. Um, uh, am I right in saying that perovskites have two particular problems, which is the practical use, the lead, and the life? Um, the, uh, tell us about it what, and how you address these things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> indeed. So um, our main main focus, we had we had two EU projects uh, where we developed perovskite printing. This was Cheops and FlexPV, um, and, and our our task, or our, our main focus was there the scaling um, of the of the perovskite manufacturing from small lab scale to larger size. For example, here we have the, we have a 15 by 15 perovskite inkjet printed layer, which was then cured under inert atmosphere, um, and um, has a reasonable closed layer for further application. We could make perovskite solar cells with a size of up to 10 by 10 centimeters, um, which had uh, efficiencies between 8 and 10 percent, which is already quite good for that large yes, size. Yes, 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 yes. When it comes to the problematic of lead, um, these layers uh, of perovskites are extremely thin. Um, if you think of a, of a to, to place this in a solar module, and if you would solder the soli solar module with lead containing solder pastes, you would ha have more lead in the solder pastes than in your perovskite module. Wow, and in the right, solar industry, yeah. um, still today, um, most of the companies use lead containing solder pastes. I indeed, right, right. Yeah, mm. So it's a relative problem, that's absolutely. And you did that in sandwiching glass, did you? 
And this is this is just this is this is a demonstrator for for the printing size. This is not a functioning OPV. Yeah. This is yeah. just one layer sandwiched between glasses. Yeah. So that the that the perovskite is sealed inside. Yes. Yes. Of course. And when using this technology, one also has to address the recycling issue. Yes. 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 Um, it is not much, but of course we are aware that lead is a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and they, they are. There are ways to, by recycling, to, to reduce also this low amount of lead right. contamination to the environment. Well, that's yeah. good news. And um, are you? Is this ongoing work, or an EU um, project that's finished? I mean, ongoing. Yep. We'd like to see you getting up to flexible and huge areas and uh, um, absolutely low costs and so on. So that's, that, yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's something we would really like to continue our work on. And uh, we are in the process of further project applications, and we, we hope that we that we win uh, one of the future calls oh, to, to continue with work, with and, work and in this direction. There are two uh, two directions, for instance, um, in the laboratory. Some people, I think, claim over twenty percent efficiency. So you hope to try to get up to that in practical terms. Is that right? Th that's that's right. And the, on the small small scale. Uh, you are you are still much much more efficient than we in a larger scale, but uh, we need we need to make the scale up also with ter in terms of efficiency. Excellent. And um, yes. with a yeah. single uh, perovskite solar cells, what we do, yes. but uh, also with the with the application to use them as a, as additional material on top of uh, yes. solar. Uh, that was my second point. Point because in the UK where I come from, that's starting to go commercial. I think the coating to get how much extra efficiency? So, um, so they, as, as far as I remember, they claim that they start from a commercial silicon-based solar cell with around 20% efficiency right. and add something like additional 10% in the beginning, in the early stages now, and um, and they say if they... Meaning 2%. 10% of 20% is 2%. 20, 10 no, no, the, becomes 22%. Uh, uh, so, so their their plan um, is, is to use the perovskite on top as an uh, on top of, of a silicon-based yeah, solar indeed. cell yeah, in, right. in a tandem yeah. stack. Yeah. So the perovskite, so the solar cell has the issue that it's not very effective in the blue yeah. visible yes. spectrum, and this is the job will be the job of the perovskite, mm. and then the perovskite will con will co collect mostly the bluish area of the of the light um, the brownish yellow uh, yellowish part will be transmitted to the silicon based solar cell and and then you lower the efficiency of the solar cell because you already captured the blue part of the spectrum but you end up with something like 20% plus plus additional 10% um, their goal is to achieve to, to get through the the, the goal so, of 30% efficiency with oh, this tandem oh, cell. Oh, it really is 10%, not 10% off. That's right. So uh -huh. 30%. That's they, they, a huge that's, gain. That's they their huge gain. When they, they they claim, if they can get further than 30%, they can get further what will be ever possible with the silicon solar cells. Do you, do polycrystalline you, polycrystalline cell. solar cells. And if they, they achieve this goal, they will be relevant on the market. So you would work on leapfrogging that with single crystal silicon? Is that sensible or not? Um, that's a good question. So we are, uh, as SD Partner, we are we are focused on this on the solely on the polar. Uh, so far, we only worked uh, on on the uh, perovskite solar cells, not on the tandem cells. This was not work we did. Oh, right, so it's forward of now. Mm -hmm. And and can it's you say if you would be interested in doing it with single crystal silicon? I mean, I read that the Chinese are putting in massive capacity for single crystal silicon and making mm -hmm. statements like uh, the polycrystalline silicon will vanish off the face of the earth mm -hmm. <laughs> because the okay. single crystal will give you smaller areas or higher efficiency or one way or the other the higher efficiency will give you smaller areas or lower cost or whatever uh, in the total system level and uh, if it is given that you're not working on it now but in terms of your dream if you are able to fund and proceed with adding uh, perovskites to the um, 
silicon solar cells. Would you, do you think personally you would work on polycrystalline? Is it sensible to try to? Is it? Uh, indeed, I, I, th I think um, uh, uh, polycrystalline is, 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 yeah, is, is uh, still still this. Um, uh, it's it's a good good opportunity to, to combine the the, the, um, the standard technique with it, which yeah, is developed, yeah, which is yeah. which is affordable. Yeah, so um, it's, it's with, a, a logical thing to do. Yeah. And and that coated coating processes can be done in principle with flexible versions, can it? The things what we developed in, in, in this project, the inkjet printing. It's, yes. it's fully compatible with, uh, with flexible substrates. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's the way why we uh, why we chose mm. this pathway. Uh, it's scalable. It's very uh, material effective. Yeah. Uh, and uh, and yeah. it's compatible to, to many types of substrates. And the um, yeah. it, when you have the perovskite on its own, um, is it ever going to be tightly rollable? Do you think? I mean, they're, they're, we always had the dream of the, uh, you know, we all. It never happened, but I mean, Samsung issued um, all sorts of publicity five years ago. It's always two years off, wasn't it? We were going to my Samsung phone. I was going to be able to pull it out and I have a big keyboard and photovoltaics and display and twang and it shot back. I love that. That would be wonderful. Yeah. I really like that, but I don't see it anywhere. But. Uh, it is sometimes tightly rollable devices. The problem is actually the transparent conducting electrode, isn't it? Yes. Um, what's the impediment with perovskite to do the photovoltaic part of that story? It's, it's the same. You also need the transparent electrode, of course. And they do, do they exist now, do you think? Uh, the tightly rollable, you know, less than a millimeter <laughs> diameter. That's 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 still still still, still work to be done. Still, still work, to work be done. in progress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, there, there are advantages with silver nanowires. Graphene may also be some solution, but mm. uh, but uh, I, I'm not uh, I'm not sure if, if today you could really no. okay. reach the, the radius well, of silver millimeters. It's useful to get an update millimeters. from an expert. So do mm. you work on? Um, Transparent conductive films at all? Yes, yes, yes. We um, we use we, we work on them um, for for fl many for flexible OPVs and flexible uh, OLEDs. We did flexible organic photovoltaics um, with polymer materials on foil. Um, we did similar stuff with uh, with flexible uh, flexible OLEDs, um, but. Um, in, in that cases, we still used um, uh, quite brittle, high-performance top electrodes from ev evaporation mm. to have, uh, which, which are not bendable in the millimeter range. But um, we we also we are also using solvent processable, transparent conductive electrodes such, such as silver nanowires. And oh, you're in that area yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they cannot be inkjet printed. Mm. Uh, at least we haven't found yet uh, mm. a formulation mm. that can be inkjet printed. But with other methods, um, uh, blade coating, for example, you can you can apply them in a, in a good manner. Okay. Are there other um, possible routes that you're exploring beyond silver nanowires for transparent conductive electrodes that are very flexible, rollable? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the, the challenge is to, to get the good interconnections between between the rods, um, um, and don't making them too long so that they get brittle. So, oh. so you, you need to, to have some flexible, ideally a very conductive polymer material, which is yes. which is flexible, bendable, yes. um, but still uh, has a, has a high enough conductivity. Um, oh, we yeah, were, right, we, absolutely. We, yes, we were, yes, because their large area is particularly acute. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. For, we, we, we keep an eye on the graphene market yes. and there are some companies now who claim they achieved 20 ohm square with a transparency of, of uh, 70 to 80 percent. And this ah. would be then uh, interesting to oh, right. test yes, in OPV yes, and, yes, and yes. OLED applications. And then the challenge will be to get the cost out in large area versions, won't it? That'll be a real challenge. But it doesn't mean it can't be done. I mean, absolutely. I think what you're doing is really exciting. And um, with our relative lack of knowledge of, of what you're doing, what questions should I have asked? What things have I not asked you about? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so um, 
we haven't talked, talked yet about the, 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 the S-chip printing, for example, the electrostatic ah. printing, what, which, we, which we were awarded from, for. <laughs> no, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Tell us, do. Can you come around? Uh, it's down here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Closer? No problem. Ready? Maybe uh, this way? Or the, uh, can, can you explain? No, no, I mean, huh? can you explain? Yeah, okay, I'll click. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Just looking for the right place to stand. Okay. So, we, um, we just... We just fin successfully finished the EU project High Response, and together with our partners, we managed to to print an active matrix OLED display with a size of 0.5 inch, with a resolution for of 300 dpi, um, and uh, an amount of approximately 65,000 pixels, each of them 10 micrometer in diameter only, and. This wouldn't, wouldn't have been possible by traditional inkjet technology, but in this project we were, um, anal we were interested in the opportunities of a new technology called electrostatic jetting, S-jet technology, which is shown above here. So we use an ultra-fine glass needle, which has a metal wire inside, and this is connected to a high voltage supply and the counter electrode is below our substrate or the active matrix backplane. And by applying a high voltage field, we force the ink out of the nozzle through a tailor cone onto the substrate without any moving parts, without the use of piezo. And therefore, we can print feature sizes much smaller than the nozzle diameter. Uh, and by this achieving high resolution printing of organic materials, such as P.PSS, which is shown here with diameters of only 10 micrometer. And using this printing technology and printing them into well-defined cavities, here you see 15 micrometer cavities with the droplets which have diameters of 10 micrometers, we finally could print on the active matrix backplane of IMAC and TNO, the Holtz Center, which they provided to us. And we were filling the small white dots here with, of 10 nanometer diameter each by printing. And using an, a, normal, a traditional inkjet printer, we would just had, had have droplets that were twice or thrice the size. But here we were able to hit each and every single pixel finally achieving separate illuminating pixels in the active matrix backplane. And the demonstrator was able to show the different logos of the partners, one after another, because it is an inkjet printed active matrix display. And for this one, we won here the best Do you have uh, it academy, here? Uh, academic Is it award. here? It's, it's there. The price, the, the, price. the, the screen? The screen. the screen is at the moment at the booth of iMac. It's only yeah. the, the way. Should we go there? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, we, we're going to, to iMac. Okay, let's go. Yeah. So how so. far is iMac? Let's go. Um, yeah, we, we, are almost, are we are almost there. Yeah. It's a cool show, right? Yeah, absolutely. Are you tech X? It's fine. We, we, are, we are here every year in Berlin, and uh, it's, it's a really great, uh, great show. And so that's the screen so, here. So that's the screen. We, uh, you, you we moved the, the cap. Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Is this the printed? Uh, this is, this is the, the, the printed display. We printed one of the organic layers by Estrid. The second layer is spin coated, and the third layer is evaporated. This is a top emitting OLED. Is this, is this the first uh, printed uh, active matrix OLED? No, no, not, not the first printed active matrix OLED. But it's. Um, but it, it is. Yeah, it, but is, it the, is. It is the first S jet printed active matrix OLED. 
meaning it is so far the uh, the printed OLED with the highest resolution, with the, well, with the smallest pixel size. So this highest pixel density um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, print, printed uh, OLED. So you. Yeah. Yeah. Due, due to the backplane, it's still seven. Uh, it, it is it is 300 ppi, meaning the pixels have a pitch of uh, of 75 uh, micrometer. But uh, the the pixel size of only 10 micrometer diameter shows the the capability for future applications. And um, with with respect to to the pixel size, um, uh, we 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 had a breakthrough in in resolution. We, we, we showed that the breakthrough in resolution will be possible. So the breakthrough in the... Um, is it possible to have a printed OLED that has all the colors, uh, the saturation, everything? Indeed. So if you oh, go to yeah. the post or to take, take this one. Um, so here you see um, the distance from, from, from column to column is 75 micron. This defines the 300 uh, PPI, which, we, uh, which our demonstrator had. But in the uh, along single columns, we have pixel distances of only 25 micrometer, and the, the backplane is ready for RGB. Um, it was, it is now the next step to to print three different OLED materials, namely the re a red, a green, and a blue one, uh, one after another, so that we have a red, green, blue, red, green, blue pixel. Um, which which then make up a full RGB uh, AMOLED display. Is that how AMOLED is usually? This red, green, blue, red, green, blue. That's how AMOLED. No, is. no, no. Color no. AMOLED. How do you do? Uh, no, no, normally, normally they they are different different ways to, to do this. Um, they are they are they are applications where they make they, where they make them square. You have red, uh, where you have two two, two blues uh, crossing each other, and then red and a green one on, on the other sides. Um, this way, you uh, in in every line and every, every column, you only have two colors. You can get high, higher resolution in, in, in this type of application. Um, but there are various kinds of how to organize the pixels. Here, it, here it was um, the reason to apply them this way was that the backplane is also a special development by by uh, our academic partners. So it's not a commercial backplane, but this has has specifically been. Uh, developed for our project here, and in terms of resolution, this was all also something new for T TNO to get to make their their AMOLED displays um, in this uh, in this small size. Cool.